All right, good morning. I want to welcome you to Church Without Religion. My name's Andrew Farley. I'm the pastor here. I'm so glad you're with us this morning. We're going to continue with our series looking at suffering, the spirit, and other concerns. We're now in part three. Let's open with a word of prayer together. Father, we thank you for this time. We just ask that you would minister to us by your word and by your spirit, that you would show us some things that maybe we've never seen before. And through looking at these questions and your answers based on your word, Father, we just ask that you would counsel and comfort and teach and guide us into all truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, suffering the spirit and other concerns. Here we've been addressing a number of questions that people have brought forth after being exposed to the grace of God and wondering how certain ideas and elements fit into their understanding. So uh, here's a question. It says, what is your response to Martin Luther? We are more wicked than we will ever know but more loved than we ever dare dream. Well, uh, it's interesting that this question comes because here we are looking at the birthday, the 500-year birthday of the Protestant Reformation. And you know, as well as I do, how important that Reformation was, that Martin Luther uh, put his 95 objections on the door of that church and began to protest against certain things in Catholicism. Well, I would argue that we need to continue protesting. We need to continue disagreeing with certain things that are going on in the name of Protestantism. Uh, Protestants need to continue to protest. We haven't gone far enough. And so, you know, here's a quote from Martin Luther. I'll read it again for your sake. Uh, We're more wicked than we will ever know, but more loved than we ever dare dream. Well, then I guess the question is, is does God love wickedness? How would you answer that? Does God love wickedness? Now, I know that he loves the world. I know that he wants to save the world. But does God actually love something that is wicked by nature? Does God love sin? Uh, Does God have a capacity within himself to have an affection for something that is utterly sinful by nature? Well, we find that in salvation, he changes us. So clearly, uh, he detests sin. He hates sin. He hates wickedness. So when he changes us, uh, that's important to, to recognize that we go through a transformation at salvation for a reason. And that is because God does not love wickedness. He puts wickedness on the cross. He crucifies us with Christ buries us with him, and raises us to a new identity, not as someone who is wicked. So if Martin Luther is addressing saints here, if Martin Luther is addressing believers here, then I would say that he's off base in saying that we are more wicked than we will ever know. Now, that is true of us before salvation, but this is one of those areas where I'm saying we need to continue to protest. We need to protest against Martin Luther's statement, for example, and say, hey, Marty, Marty, hold on a minute. Uh, You didn't go far enough. You're not talking about our new identity in Jesus Christ here. Uh, It's true that we're more loved than we ever dare dream, but you said we're more wicked than we will ever know. That was before I was born again. That was before I was born of God's Spirit. That was before I was crucified with Christ. That was before I became a new creation. So it's not just Martin Luther, but of course many have followed on the heels of this statement and developed that dirty worm theology that we are so desperately wicked, that we are dirty, that we are rotten at the core, and we somehow think this is humility. Well, as I said last week, that's really fake humility. Real humility is saying the same thing that God says about us, no more and no less. So we need to embrace our new identity in Christ and recognize we're not wicked. We don't have two identities. We don't have two selves. We don't have two hearts. And all of this, I am so wicked, Lord, talk, well, it sounds really, really humble, but it actually neglects what Jesus Christ did to us on the cross 
as we were placed in him and resurrected to new life. So in regards to this Martin Luther statement, we are more wicked than we will ever know. That was true before salvation, but God does not love wickedness. He transforms it. And that is why we were placed in Christ, taken out of Adam, placed in Christ, the old self crucified, the old wicked self crucified and buried and gone, and we were raised to newness of life as saints, not sinners by nature. We are saints who sometimes sin. So Martin Luther, a big figure in Christianity, a big figure in human history, we're tempted to just say, oh, how, how profound that statement is. But when we take a deeper look, there's a bit to analyze there, a bit to consider. Martin, who is your audience? And are you saying that believers are more wicked than they will ever know? I would argue that we are more righteous than we will ever know. We are more holy than we will ever comprehend. We are the righteousness of God, and we cannot fully comprehend that this side of heaven. In fact, we may spend eternity probing the depths of all that it means, uh, all of what it means to be new in Jesus Christ. All right, question number two. If there's no work left to be done then what about the spiritual disciplines? Where do they fit in? Well, that's a great question. First, I think the first half of your question is, you know, there's no work left to be done. What does that mean? Well, that doesn't mean that there are no works left to happen on planet Earth. Of course, God has prepared good works in advance that we can walk in them. So there's plenty of works, plural, that are going to happen as we continue to live life in Him, walking by His Spirit, trusting Him, not trying, but trusting, He is going to bear His fruit through us. It's called the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruit of the law, not the fruit of the loom, not the fruit of, of human effort, uh, but the fruit of His Spirit. And so when we understand where the fruit is coming from, well, that's pretty important. It's pretty important because then we realize we're the branch and he's the vine. And I don't have to be the vine. I don't have to be the world changer. I don't have to be the strength. I don't have to be the source. I don't have to try to be like Christ. I get to let Christ be Christ in and through me as I just simply let that happen. Let the mind of Christ counsel me. Let the power of Christ run my life. Let him live in and through me as I live in him, joined to him forever. So there are works left to be done, but in this statement, we're of course referring to the finished work of Christ. In that regard, what Jesus did on the cross, there is nothing left to be done. Look, Jesus will never die for your sins ever again. Why not? Because it worked the first time. He got it right. It was a perfect work. Tetelestai, right? Uh, it is finished. Well, uh, that is a statement that is true. It rings true today. It is true today that Jesus Christ, his finished work is truly finished. So he, he will never hang on a cross again. He will never be resurrected again. Uh, it worked for us. And if we are in him, there is no work that we need to add to what Jesus did. So you see the difference then. There are ongoing uh, works of the Spirit or ongoing fruit of the Spirit that are, these things are happening daily as we wake up and walk into them, these things that God has prepared in advance, that we would walk in them. But that's very different from what Jesus Christ did 2,000 years ago as a saving work, as a redemptive work, as a work on the cross and in the tomb and through the resurrection. Of course, we can't add to what he did there. So now, uh, the last part of this question is, what about spiritual disciplines? I mean, if the finished work is finished, where do spiritual disciplines fit in? Well, what we're trying to do there is we're trying to take Christian lingo, we're trying to take Christianese, we're trying to take some of these buzzwords from today and make them fit our theology. That's really what's happening in this question. If there's no work left to be done because it's the finished work of Christ, then what about spiritual disciplines? Well, who said anything about spiritual disciplines? Uh, I mean, I know that term is in the Bible belt, but it's not in the Bible. Does God ever tell you that you need to discipline yourself and make yourself pray? 
No, a prayer is talking to Father. Prayer is talking to Dad. Prayer is communicating with God. It's not supposed to be a discipline. If my son Gavin came to me and said, uh, Dad, you know, I really, you know, most days I don't really feel like talking to you, but don't you worry, Dad. I've been disciplining myself in- into talking to you, so I've set up an appointment and I'm going to make myself talk to you through this self discipline. Well, that would hurt me pretty deeply. The, the son, the very son that uh, my wife gave birth to, our son, who's part of our family, doesn't want to talk to me. And so it takes discipline for him to do so. What about reading the Bible? We call that a spiritual discipline sometimes. It kind of implies that uh, we don't really want to read it because it's a bit of drudgery. It's a bit of hard work to read it. It's a bit um, miserable when we're reading it. But, oh, well, we're supposed to, so we better. So we better tell people it's a spiritual discipline. And what happens is that appeals to their flesh. It appeals to... Uh, human effort, and then we think of reading the Bible as drudgery but discipline. Well, you know, again, if I were to send some letters to my son Gavin as he were studying overseas, for example, you know, I would hope that he wouldn't write back, hey, Dad, didn't really want to read these, didn't even want to open the envelopes, but uh, realized through a series of commitments and through meeting with my accountability group that uh, I really should be reading these letters. So I kind of forced myself through discipline to open each envelope and take some time with your letters. Well, again, what would that make me feel? Obviously, he has the impression that those letters must contain some pretty bad news or at least only tolerable news that he might not enjoy reading. So therefore, it takes discipline to read them. So do you see what we've done? In fact, the enemy has done a masterful job here of thinking, of causing us to think that talking to dad and reading his love letters to us are some sort of discipline that we must perform instead of uh, allowing us to operate in an atmosphere of freedom. The Bible says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And believe me, I am nuts. I am crazy over the Word of God. I love the Bible. I have found such freedom, such liberty, such joy from studying the Scriptures. And there really is no message. Apart from the Word of God, we've got nothing to talk about this morning. So it's exciting to look into God's Word, especially when you know that the truth will always set you free. So... You know, what about spiritual disciplines? Well, it seems like we're trying to take a Bible Belt piece of terminology and push it into our theology to try to get it to fit. What I'm saying is we don't have to do that. Let's not try to get buzzwords and popular jargon from today to fit our theology. Let's have all the jargon fit what the Bible actually says. Let's have all of our buzzwords change so that they actually fit with what the scriptures teach us about who we are in Christ and about the liberty we enjoy in Him. So don't think of prayer and Bible study and church attendance as spiritual disciplines. Think of them as opportunities to get encouraged and to be inspired from the heart. That's not about discipline. It's about relationship. It's not about forcing yourself. It's about realizing, whoa, this is good food. I could eat bad food and die or I could eat good food and live, I'll take good food. That's just common sense. All right, the next question. Uh, How do our behavior and attitudes and actions progressively improve and change? Only by our choices or by spiritual intervention? Well, to that one, I would say the answer is yes. In other words, all of the above. We're trying to dissect it. Are there any choices I need to make? Oh, you better believe there are. Of course there's choices we need to make, right? I mean, don't you make choices to respond to your children in certain ways, to respond to your spouse in certain ways, to respond to your circumstances in certain ways? We either choose hope in the Lord or we choose depression and desperation. We choose fear or we choose confidence. We choose love or we choose to keep score and be bitter toward people and resentful. We are choosing things 
all the time, aren't we? So clearly, our behavior, our attitudes, our actions, over time, they are progressively changing as we make these choices. But isn't there also spiritual intervention? Well, of course there is. He who began a good work in you will carry you on to completion. So what are we seeing here? I'm choosing, but he's working. I'm choosing, but he's working. It reminds me of what Paul said, I labor and I strive according to the power that works within me. This goes back to what we were talking about last week. We're not really in competition with Jesus Christ. It's not him or us or him or us. It is partnership. It is union. We are on the same team. So it's both our choices and his intervention that has an impact on our attitudes and actions. So this reminds me of the passage that says, work out your salvation for God is at work in you. You see that? I'm not working for my salvation, but I'm working out my salvation with all of these choices that I make. I've got salvation inside of me. Are you kidding me? I have the saving life of Jesus Christ in me. Well, then I'm going to make some choices so that that saving life, the expressions of that life are worked out since God has already been worked in. So there are choices that we make, and there is spiritual intervention. People say, you know, it says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How does that happen? Do I make any choices for the mind renewal, or is it all the Spirit? And again, the answer is yes. It's all of Him and all of you and all of Him and all of you. You make choices. I mean, have you ever noticed that if you choose to eat the good food of God's Word, that it pays off? that there's fruit that is born from that, that your thinking changes. As we gather together on Sunday mornings and sing songs and set our minds and encourage each other in the Word and love on each other and fellowship together, have you not noticed that this has a positive outlook, a, a positive impact on your outlook concerning worldly circumstances and things that are coming at you and things that you're dealing with. So it's all of the above. It's not Christ or me or Christ or me. It is us together. Paul says, I labor and I strive, but it's according to the spirit that is working in him. So it is teamwork, a partnership. We are not the source. We are not the strength. But we do give him permission, don't we? We have to give God permission in any moment to renovate our thinking. He's not going to knock down that door. He, at salvation, he knocked on the door, but he didn't knock it down. In the same way, regarding our attitudes and actions, he's not going to knock us over and circumvent our will. We have to be willing. We have to give the Lord God, the Lord of the universe, we have to give him permission to renew our minds in certain ways. It's like the software updates example that I give. We can, you know, when you get the software update, you can X out of it or you can accept. Those are choices. But we are not the source of that mind change. We are not the strength behind it, but we do make decisions in the moment. So don't be fooled. If you make bad decisions, poor decisions, there are earthly consequences for those. If you make good decisions, trusting in Christ for new attitudes and actions, there are also good consequences from those decisions. All right, well, if God has already forgiven us once for all, and we cannot possibly confess every single one of our sins, then what is the purpose of repentance? Can we wound, that should be wound, can we wound God's heart by not repenting? Great question. Uh, first of all, what is repentance? Well, repentance is changing your mind. Uh, as we see, the definition of repentance in the Scripture is essentially doing a 180. You were going in this direction, and then you choose to go in this direction. So it's pulling a 180, and we've talked about repentance for salvation. And literally 90% of the uses of the word repentance in the Bible uh, are related to the salvation decision. There are exceptions. I mean, there are exceptions when Paul hopes the Corinthian man will repent. 
Uh, There is an exception in Revelation when John writes and God is speaking through the Apostle John in Revelation talking about repenting, a whole group of people that needed to repent and do the deeds that they were doing at first. They had lost sight. They had forgotten about Jesus. They had lost sight of their first love and they were distracted. So there are some occasions in the Bible where repentance is referring to the middle of the Christian life, where we do a 180. We're harboring resentment and bitterness, and we turn away from that attitude and take a different attitude, adopting a new perspective. But 90% of the times that repentance is used actually refers to turning away from unbelief in the gospel and turning toward belief in the gospel, turning away from denying Jesus as Savior and turning toward belief in Jesus as Savior. So we have to recognize that for what it is. Nevertheless, you know, it's obvious. Do we change our minds in the Christian life? Do we make decisions? Do we turn away from things? Absolutely. Romans 6 says, don't let sin reign. That means we could let sin reign, but we shouldn't. So the encouragement there, the command is, hey, don't let sin reign in your mortal bodies. Don't obey its lusts. Now, what about wounding God's heart? See, that's sort of, it's common language these days, but it sort of paints God as a very fragile figure. He's up in heaven, wounded every time we sin, Uh, You know, he's hurt deeply every time we sin. What do we really see in scriptures? We don't see that God is wounded exactly. I mean, we see that he does have emotions. He does have thoughts. He does have deep concern for us. I mean, that's a fact, and I'm glad of that, aren't you? The Bible talks about quenching God's Spirit. So apparently, God's Spirit is not expressed in every moment. When you choose sin, God's Spirit is not expressed. That's just common sense. When we choose to harbor resentment and bitterness, we are quenching God's Spirit. We're not allowing God's Spirit to be expressed. Now, that doesn't mean God's Spirit went anywhere. He didn't leave us. He didn't forsake us. And He also didn't blow up at us. He's not angry at us. People say, well, what about, uh, you know, grieving God's Spirit? Well, grief, when a mother grieves over her child, that's that deep concern for for that child, the deep concern for what they're going through. It's not that the mother is angry at their child. They're grieving over what's happened. We grieve when people die. We grieve when people get hurt. Mothers grieve, for example, when their children make uh, mistakes that really hurt them. And so the consequences for that child looking at what's happening, uh, that grieves the caring mother. Well, I'm glad God feels that way. But that doesn't mean he's fragile. We're not going to break God. We're not going to crush God. We're not going to surprise God. We can't even really disappoint God. Do you realize that disappointment would be, oh, I had certain expectations for you, but you fell short of them. And so now I'm surprised and disappointed because what happened didn't match up with my expectations for you. Disappointment is when the outcome doesn't match the expectation. Well, look, God is smarter than that. He knows all things. He knows the future. He knows every sin we will ever commit. He knows them in advance. So we can't surprise God. We can't disappoint God. We can't anger God because all of that was put on Jesus Christ. So don't think of God up in heaven just aching and breaking and with his achy, breaky heart up there in heaven as a fragile figure, a fragile father figure. Not the case. Uh, Certainly, he cares deeply about us, but he is complete, and he is whole, and he is stable, and he never needed us to begin with, but he chose to allow us to participate in this incredible relationship with him. All right, here's another question five. I think we need to be careful here. I'm really starting to enjoy God. (laughs) Well, that's not really a question, is it, unless you're thinking, uh, Huh, am I allowed to enjoy God this much? And certainly as we get acquainted with the grace of God, we start exclaiming things like this. This is too good to be true. This can't be right. It feels too good. 
And as I've said many times, you know, we used to judge the quality of a sermon or the quality of a church experience by how bad we feel outside in the parking lot headed home. Boy, I feel horrible. What a great sermon. I feel so condemned and convicted and dirty. What a great day at church. And so this person, you know, a little tongue-in-cheek, a little sarcastic, a little humor here, is saying, whoa, whoa, put the brakes on. Let's be careful here. I'm really starting to enjoy God. Is it okay to enjoy our Heavenly Father? You know, the whole point is that we believers should be the most uh, joyful people on the planet. We should be enjoying ourselves more than anyone else. All right, question six. Uh, When trying to witness to a friend that is of another faith, why is my view or belief any better or more right than theirs? Why is my belief that Jesus plus nothing is all I need better than what they believe about confessing sins to a man and having to do certain things to be forgiven? Now, I've addressed this recently, uh, but, you know, it deserves repetition here, I think, because of the relativism that we see. There's a lot of relativism in today's society. Uh, I shouldn't mess with you because your beliefs are just as good as my beliefs, and so I shouldn't intervene. I shouldn't show any concern. I shouldn't challenge. I shouldn't question. I shouldn't even try to help uh, with my faith or my beliefs uh, being the intervening factor there because... Well, I just need to embrace what you believe and you embrace and accept what I believe. And even if we say the opposite thing, uh, maybe they're both right or maybe they're both fine and acceptable. And maybe there are many roots and many roads and many religions and many belief systems that will in the end work themselves out. This sort of uh, thinking is pervasive today. But let's just take this uh, concrete example here as the backdrop. What if my belief that Jesus plus nothing is all I need, how is that any better than what they believe about confessing sins to a man? Well, uh, it's better because one is conditional and the other is not. It's better because one says it's finished and the other says it's not finished. It's better because one requires a third party, another human, and the other is you've been forgiven, period, from the God of the universe, and he knows what he's talking about. So practically speaking, one is better than the other. I mean, if I told you, here's a million dollars, but all you need to do is work for it for 40 years, or here's a million dollars and you need to do nothing but accept it, which, which one is better? Which situation, which scenario is ideal? Obviously, one is superior to the other. Why work for it for 40 years if you can get it free? So this relativism does not stack up even on a practical level, as we look at the two different beliefs about forgiveness. If I believe I am getting forgiven progressively, little by little, from a priest, or even in Protestantism, if I believe I am getting forgiven progressively by asking God for forgiveness, and then He sort of swoops down and zaps me with a new portion of forgiveness and cleansing every time I repent or every time I ask or every time I confess, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Well, obviously, you know, we've talked about this. What if you miss one? What if you forget on Tuesday? What if by Wednesday you forgot all about Monday's sins and you never confess them or never ask forgiveness? So practically speaking, obviously one system is superior than another. If I told you you're forgiven once for all versus you need to get forgiven and stay forgiven daily, which one is more appealing? Which one is more freeing? Which one is more liberating? Well, the Bible says the truth will set you free. So in this case, one of these belief systems is bondage, and one of these belief systems is freeing. So you don't need to just sort of sit on your hands and say in passivity, nobody needs what I'm selling, nobody needs what I believe. Let me tell you, the world desperately needs what we believe. The world desperately needs to understand that Christianity is not about judgment and punishment. It is about forgiveness and mercy and grace and kindness. And all we have to do is open the door to who Jesus really is. And what happens after that is unbelievable. It is unmistakable. It is incredible. 
and there's no fly in the ointment, there's no worm in the apple to ruin it, but people need to know. And so in this age of relativism, I would encourage you not to think along those lines. Be proud of what you believe because you are proud of what Jesus Christ did on that cross. You are proud that it worked. You are proud that he was so successful. You are proud that the gospel is genius, that the gospel is amazing, so utterly powerful to change lives just as it has changed yours. So be ready to give an account of this hope that is within you, not using pressure, but just be ready. And when the time comes, don't hold back. Don't be bashful. Don't be shy. Don't be so careful that you don't communicate. Go ahead. Let them know about this great hope that we have in Jesus Christ and why, specifically why, it is so much better living under the new covenant than it is uh, trying to get more and more forgiveness progressively. Tomorrow's sins are already forgiven. Wow. Whoa. What? (laughs) That begs a lot of questions, doesn't it? Tomorrow's sins are already forgiven. God has already seen them. He's already forgiven and forgotten them. He has taken them away as far as the east is from the west because it was once for all forgiveness. That's incredible, and it's worth talking about, isn't it? All right, question seven. You said that few people preach on the new covenant. So if so, what would you say it is that they are preaching? We know many who would agree with salvation through grace, but they think the issue of the new covenant is a secondary issue. All right, good question, an important one. What are people preaching? Well, I can't answer that for everyone out there. I don't know what everyone out there is preaching, but I will say this, that Paul tells the Corinthians In 2 Corinthians, he says that we are qualified to preach one thing. He says that we are qualified as ministers, not of the law, not of the letter, but of the new covenant of the Spirit. So did you know that you are a minister, that we are all ministers? Yeah, I preach on Sundays, but we are all ministers, every single one of us. And ministry is ministering the life of Jesus Christ to other people through loving them and encouraging them and building them up in the faith. So what are we qualified to do? Well, we're qualified to love them and minister to them through the new covenant. That's what 2 Corinthians tells us. We're not qualified to minister anything else. So people that think that the new covenant is a secondary issue, they're missing it. They're calling it a secondary issue when it's the primary issue. The new covenant is everything. By grace, through faith, at the start, and by grace, through faith, as we continue in Him. That is the new covenant. Complete forgiveness, once for all, not under law, but under grace. A brand new identity, a new heart, a new spirit, God's spirit living within us. This is what the new covenant is. I will be their God, and they will be my people. I will remain faithful, even when they are faithless. I will not disown them, because I cannot disown myself. I live in them, and I won't disown myself, so I won't disown them. All of this security and forgiveness and kindness and grace, it's under one umbrella concept, and that is the new covenant. It is not a secondary issue. It is a primary issue. It is the gospel itself. And so many people are teaching salvation through grace, but that's just getting us started with new life in Christ. What about the next day when we wake up? How do we continue? Well, the Bible says, just as you received him, walk in him. There's not two methods. There's not two ways. Just as we started, that's how we continue. We started by saying, Lord Jesus Christ, I cannot save myself. I need you to save me. So then we continue by saying, Lord Jesus Christ, I cannot live this Christian life. I am not the source. I am not the strength. And so I'm going to let you do what only you can do in and through me. So what are other people saying? Well, you know, we have a whole laundry list 
of descriptions out there of what people are saying. I mean, people are saying, now that you're saved, you need to observe the Sabbath. Now that you're saved, you need to tithe 10%. Now that you're saved, you need to observe these laws, the moral law, the you know, some of them throw in random laws from the Old Testament. Now that you're saved, you need to watch out or you'll lose it. Now that you're saved, you need to ask for forgiveness every day to stay right with God. And if you forget a sin, ouch, man, now you're up a creek. You know, you were saved by grace through faith, but, and there comes the problem, adding a big but to the gospel, but, but, but. And you could probably think of 10 or 15 or 20 different buts that people throw in there. And they're adding to the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. And so we need to keep it simple. We need to keep it all about the new covenant. We need to keep it all about Jesus plus nothing. Because, look, the truth will always set you free every single day time. So let's be vigilant. Let's guard the truth. Let's preserve the truth. Let's promote the truth. The truth needs to be known. The world needs it desperately. Let's not mince words. Let's not compromise. Let's speak the truth in love, recognizing that truth, the truth about Jesus himself, will always set us free every single time. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you uh, for your word. We thank you for the richness of it. We thank you for your spirit who helps us comprehend it. Uh, we just ask that everything we've talked about today, that you would bring it to remem remembrance at the time we need it most. We're counting on you and trusting in you, Father, to guide us into all truth. We thank you in advance. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.